Ashley Grill, and we are the Southeast Organic Partnership at Tuskegee University. And today we are uh, spotlighting squash. That's one of our core crops that we're growing in our project. Uh, well, I should say our growers are growing, and we're also growing them at the research stations. Um, and so we have Dr. Kwaku, and I believe that Dr. Anita Chitori from Tuskegee also is going to be joining us here in a few minutes. We have Dr. Janine Franklin. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Davis. I'm sorry, Dr. Janine Davis, not Dr. Janine Franklin. And, um, and then Karen Wynn is going to be on the line with us shortly. And I see we have about maybe three or four growers on the line with us. Uh, just as a quick reminder to please mute your microphone while you're uh, not talking. And then if you want to chime in at any point, please just kind of feel free to unmute your microphone and ask questions um, as they come up. We're going to try to go ahead and focus the beginning of the, of the presentation on uh, just information coming from Dr. Kwaku and Dr. Chitori. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions afterwards. So just kind of maybe hang on to your questions for just about 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll open it up. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Franklin Corku um, to talk about squash. Yeah, I would like to talk about um, a few disease issues. Uh, Dr. Chituri will talk about um, some of the insect issues. Because we don't have a lot of uh, time for, for this, it's just going to be like an overview, but uh, you see pictures, you see uh, some of the symptoms of some of the things we talk about. Uh, and just to start with, I'd like to say that there is a, a major difference between how we handle diseases in general and how we handle insect pests. With insect pests, Pest. Normally, we're talking about, okay, we have the pest. We want to find out whether the population of that pest on the crop has attained a population where it makes financial sense to spray as opposed to allowing that population to do the amount of damage they can do. Sometimes, the population that you have of that particular pest is so low that even if you allow them to do all the damage they can do, maybe the total cost of the damage will be maybe $50, but it will cost you maybe $150 to spray the recommended application rate, which makes it not uh, of economic, it doesn't make a lot of economic sense to spray in that case. But when it comes to diseases, uh, most of the time, even the fungicides and other things that do a, a, a great job against uh, some of the diseases. Uh, you, if you know that the conditions that are very favorable to the disease are present, and especially if you hear, oh, the, the down, uh, powdery mildew is moving, it's got into uh, the next city, next you people are reporting it. It's recommended that you do what we call preventive spray. So you spray the fungicide if it's um, it's on the leaves, the foliar sprays and stuff. It helps to prevent the disease from establishing itself. So it's a little, the concept is it's a little different. And most of these fungicides, uh, they do a better job preventing the disease than uh, uh, curing a, or treating a disease that, a cycle that has already started. Having said that, I would also want to say that there are some diseases when you have them, there is no pesticide uh, that anybody can give you that can solve the problem, especially when it comes to the virus diseases, and then there are a number of bacterial type diseases. And basically what you have to do in these instances is to prevent whatever transmits the disease. And you can see my slide, you, you can see the bacterial wheels, for example. Uh, that this is the way the symptoms look like. You see the way the leaves are. Well, once this, the, we all know once the leaves are compromised in this way, photosynthetic, uh, photosynthesis becomes a, uh, a problem. They can produce the food. They can produce what we want to harvest. And um, this particular bacterial wheel is transmitted by uh, the cucumber beetle. We have the spotted cucumber beetle. Uh, we have the we have the spotted one right here. We have the banded cucumber beetle, 
we also have the striped cucumber beetle. So when you see these beetles, uh, we have to bear in mind that they are not only doing damage as uh, leaf eaters, uh, they are also transmitting these bacterial wheels, and we've seen the symptoms in the, on the previous slide. And if, it, if that's what 60, 70% of your field looks like, we all know you are not going to be able to harvest anything that justifies all the effort you have put on, on, on the farm. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about what, uh, um, uh, I want to talk about downy mildew too, which is another disease, uh, but I, I, I I'll say a few things uh, about downy uh, mildew. Um, it is favored by wet, humid conditions. And we have to take note that it can affect the, right from the sibling stage. There are different types of it. Uh, here we use fungicide, but fungicide resistance is a problem. And this is even for conventional growers. So if fung and most of these fungicides are very uh, um, effective. Uh, they, they, are, they are a lot faster acting compared to the, uh, uh, some of the ones that are available to uh, organic growers. So what I'm trying to say is that early detection of the problem of preventing it uh, through preventive sprays when the environmental conditions uh, look like they are going to favor um, the occurrence is, is going to be key. If you wait until it gets too late to start doing something, that will be a problem. Uh, uh, with the downy mildew, the symptoms, you have the upper surfaces of the leaves. They will show some kind of angular, pale green areas. And uh, there will be some pictures of some other cucabits so you see what the downy mildew looks like. So your leaves will be showing this kind of uh, features. So one of the key things is that you have to know what you are dealing with. Because um, this is a little different. You know, sometimes we have this general symptom of plant leaves looking yellow. Um, every now and then I'll get a call from a farmer and they will say, okay, my, the leaves of my uh, plant are turning yellow. Uh, and I'm, I'm unable to say anything uh, useful because the yellowing of leaves is such a general symptom. Uh, are we talking about um, uh, nutritional deficiencies? Are we talking? So a number of disease issues and even uh, 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 deficiency symptoms, uh, they, they present themselves in yellow in your leaves. So it's such a general symptom. But when you have what we are looking at, where you, you see how the yellowing is in spots and the way it looks, there are certain symptoms when you see it. Uh, you know you are looking at one thing or the other, and you will be able to differentiate uh, between uh, what's going on. So, so later on, you start seeing things like this. It keeps progressing. Uh, it gets here. Uh, and hopefully, we are not getting to this point. Hopefully, you are actually preventing the problem from starting when the environmental conditions uh, uh, detect that you start doing preventive spray. Uh, if you are if you don't catch it at that point and you are not able to do the preventive spray, then I'm expecting that the early stages of the symptoms is when you are spraying instead of getting to this point. And definitely we don't want to get to this point uh, uh, and, and and not that. Okay. Uh, conventional growers use all kinds of products which are not uh, available to us. But another thing I want to say is that there are some resistant strains um, of, 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 of squash and other crops. So I don't want to uh, use this PowerPoint or go too much into it, but you can select specific uh, types of, whether it's cucumber, uh, squash, or whatever cucumber you are dealing with that are resistant to specific pathotypes. What I mean by that is that even when we talk about downy mildew, there are different strains of the downy mildew. So when somebody says, I'm selling to you a variety uh, that is resistant to the downy mildew, uh, and then you find out that you have downy mildew problems, it's not because the person has lied to you. They may probably have sold to you a variety that is resistant to a particular pathotype of the downy mildew, 
but the one you are using is not resistant to the prototype that you have in your area. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of uh, extra um, work finding out uh, from your extension agent or your extension pathologist in, at your location if they give you an idea about the type of downy mildew you are uh, having to deal with in that area, then you will make a better choice selecting uh, a variety that is resistant to that prototype. Any questions so far? I guess no question. Okay. Another thing you can do is that you, you go online and you find some uh, um, uh, it's like a predictive, uh, you, you have a map and they'll say uh, it's been reported uh, at this location and you know it's getting closer to you and then you can start uh, doing your preventive spray. That's, you want to be cost effective. Sometimes folks don't want to start spraying a long time before uh, the, the, the pathogen uh, um, gets to that location. If that's what you want to do, then you had better be uh, looking at it's almost like a weather advisory, but in this case, it's a downy mildew uh, advisory. And then other farmers will report and they'll tell you it's gotten here, there, and then you can start doing um, a few other things. Considering the amount of time we have, I want um, if there are questions on these two things that I've talked about, we can talk about some of them. And then I would like to give um, Dr. Chituri an opportunity to talk about some some of the major insects as well. And uh, everyone, this is Dr. Yeah. Anita Chituri, and we uh, introduced her last lunchbox that we had. So we just want to, uh, again, say welcome to her. And go ahead and take it away. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I was so busy in the field, and I had to catch up with you guys. But yeah, coming to the entomology aspects, uh, uh, based on what we've been looking in the field uh, with the squash, especially right now we are looking at the harvesting stage. I just wanted to, so this is based on a visual scouting. This is what I prepared the, the PowerPoint, like at the grower perspective, like, uh, you know, we have so many insect pests that you can, you know, show on squash, but I just focus primarily on the key pests, you know. Um, so I categorized into like four, four different categories, like the beetles, the bugs, the caterpillars, and in general, the tiny things I would say like sucking pests. Like it's not generally sucking pests. I just put it as a, like a major complex of insects in that. So like, as you can see from the pictures here, um, the, major, the major insects, like oh, I would say like the threat would be the squash bug. Like you can see here, the adult here, and like when you are looking in the field, this is how the eggs look like tiny brown chocolate balls. Like, you know, you see like a mass of eggs on the, the squash leaves. So, so this is how you identify a squash bug. And, and on contrary, like you see the sting bug here, like I just wanted to emphasize like in Alabama and Georgia, they reported the brown marmorated sting bug. So there are two, like the, just the sting bug and the brown marmorated sting bug. Um, we got some samples in our field and we have to make sure it's brown marmorated sting bug. So I'm kind of just throwing some thoughts on like how you can visually identify a pest when you see in the crop. So these are the images like, like you can see here, the squash wine borer. Like you might not see the adults in the field, but like this is what you look into the eggs. Like the eggs are singly laid and you see that, especially at the fruiting stage, I mean like when at the uh, the fruiting stage of the crop. And and of course, we started noticing these, the leaf-footed bugs, like the character you see here, like the leaf, the legs are like footed and leaf-like. So so, so these these are like major things. Uh, I, will look, I will come into the control aspects by end of the, after I finish um, throwing some, like showing you the images, like how these pests in general look in the field. Um, then coming to the, the beetle complex, uh okay so like as far as alabama like in tuskegee it is concerned this is what the major thing these are the two beetles we see like almost pretty much all these three the spotted cucumber beetle the banded cucumber beetle and the striped cucumber beetle so these are the the three major beetles you see in squash and every every beetle like it's, it's kind of hard for you to see 
like uh, visually in the field, like and to capture them, but like on a on a like a, a, a slip of a second, you could very clearly see like these are the three major beetles you see in squash. And we've been also noticing this um, the flea beetles, like very tiny black spots, round spots on squash. So these are the major beetles, you know, uh, based on what we've been scouting for the past two, three weeks. Um, these are some of the key pests you would like visually see and say like, yes, this is the flea beetle, this is the, the cucumber beetle. Um, and then coming to the sucking pests, like the common things again here, um, um, yeah, I had a wrong slide here. Let me go to the, the, the caterpillars, like the eating caterpillars. We haven't yet seen anything like so far the pickle worm damage, and this is how the worm looks. Uh, but in the adult, like pretty much you don't really see the adult until and unless you have some traps or like sticky traps you trap on them. And then cutworms, we did see some cutworms in the field, um, in the soil, like some pupae. So they can be like, this is how they look like. And then when you touch those cutworms, they kind of roll out. Like, you know, you, you see the shape here. This is how they, they kind of roll out. So, and then the spider mites, we just started noticing spider mites in the squash uh, because we are having like four different varieties. Uh, so this is how you would technically see in a field visually. Like you might not see the, the, FA, the, the spider mites very closely, but definitely you would see a web and, and that's it, it's the, the spider mites. And then white flies, um, it's kind of hard when you turn on the flip on the leaves on the back side. Uh, you, you might see, you might not see, but definitely you see white uh, tiny spots, which is nothing but the, the white flies. And, and right now you might have seen this leaf minor damage where you see like tiny streaks, like white streaks on the leaves. Uh, which is like the decorative leaf, which is pretty much the um, the leaf minor damage. And we, we we like saw here in there the leaf minor damage. So overall, those are like the different kind of pests. Like and, and and I just thought like showing the images would be more useful, more useful because when you see the feel and when it matches with the image, like yes, well I know this is what it is. So we also have some recommendations um, uh, in general, like. Ephids, like you can use neem oil extract, which is um, which is again a contact insecticide, which is natural. And and like cucumber beetles, uh, like neem and pyrethrin, squash beetles, pyrethrin and neem, pickle worms. Again, uh, it's a, it's a combination: pyrethrin, neem, and spinosad. Squash vine borer, pretty much neem, because the reason why I, I just want to emphasize why we are saying neem. Neem has a unique character, which is the bitterness. And when the caterpillars kind of feed on the foliage, um, that's when, you know, that kind of deters the caterpillar to feed. And also, by any chance, if you see any eggs on the leaves, which are not visible to a naked eye, but when you spray neem, those eggs are going to be like, uh, uh, it's not spoiled, but they, they cannot, the, the, the egg ones cannot emerge out of those eggs. So neem is one effective uh, spray that you could use, uh, especially for leaf-eating caterpillars and spider mites and squash bugs. Anything that chews and eats the leaf, uh, neem would be the best thing. And also we can also alternate with pyrethrin and spinosad. But before we get into these recommendations, like which pesticide and which organic pesticide we spray, we have to make sure like we look into the ETLs, the economic threshold level. So what we've been like standard, like the protocol, what we've been following in the in the plots is for every 10 plants, there is a, a specific threshold you look into, like for example, in squash. Um, so the economic threshold, when you look into your visual, visual sampling, like you just walk through 10 plants and you see over 10 plants, if you can find one adult bug or like one egg mass, so you're almost reaching the threshold. So that's when the farmers have to look, the growers have to look into, yes, this is close to the ETL. And if you notice like series of egg masses in, in about 10 plants, then we need to go ahead and start spraying. And also I would recommend like when you are spraying, we do it in the evening because most of the pesticides, like the natural pesticides we are using, we want to use them late in the evening because so that they could, the pesticide can um, the insecticide or the pesticide could stay on the crop 
and be more effective because that's when late in the evening uh, the the insects kind of come and feed the the other contrary if you want to spray in the morning because of the sunlight the chemical becomes volatile and 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 so it's not recommended uh, it's strongly suggested that we go for pesticide or whatever the pyrethrin neem or spinous we are spraying like late in the afternoon like around four or five where the temperature and the sunshine is little less so that the, the insecticide we are spraying is effective through the night and we can be able to uh, control the insects effectively. So that, those are like a couple of things we need to keep in mind, like you spray it only during the, the evening and then you make sure you are looking into the ETL, like you don't have to go ahead and spray. So uh, I'm pretty sure like we send this information about these ETLs for each insect and based on that, like we have to decide on going for the spray. So in a, in a nutshell, I think that these are the major things. Um, I thought the couple of insects uh, we want to like really focus on and like Dr. Franklin discussed about the, so like these beetles, these beetles, they play a major role in spreading out the bacterial wilt diseases. So if we are not able to effectively manage the beetles, so there is every chance that they are going to feed on the fruits, they are rotting, they are creating fungus, so we just have to keep in these things in mind, um, like we are also focusing on the sanitize, sanitation, because like when you see a rotting fruit or like uh, when there is more rain, like you see like the fruits are lying on the ground and we just want to ensure like we pick those fruits so that we don't promote for the further spread of fungal diseases. Like that's what, what we are noticing right now in squash, like, you know, so we just have to keep in mind when we are, when we see beetles especially, um, and you see an egg mass, we just have to go ahead and just spray and make sure we are following the ETLs. So that's pretty much I want to add for the insect pest complex. Um, if you have any questions or um, anything, I would be happy to yeah, answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Chatori. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. So if anyone has a question, please go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask away. Uh, Leslie, I just want to add, like, if anybody is interested, I can share this PowerPoint, um, uh, you know, like uh, what all I discussed right now so that, you know, they can go back and if they need to look into the images, uh, you know, um, because I believe in a visual supporting rather than like, you know, reading from a literature or something like that, because these are the things you really see in the field and the farmer needs to know what the bug is and what ETL he's following and what he wants to spray. Absolutely. So I would be happy to share later with you. Okay. Thank yes, thanks so much. I'll actually get both of your presentations and we will put these slides up on our knowledge base and share the link. Um, in fact, in this chat uh, right now, the, I did post the link. Uh, if you scroll up through the chat, uh, you can go see our knowledge base there. We're just starting to fill it out. So we're going to make, we will make a follow-up for this lunchbox number three, Spotlight on Squash. Uh, we will, we will uh, put all of the information and images and everything uh, there and share that link out with our growers. At some, at some point, I also want to share like small video clips on insects what we have we've been recording in the field. Yes. So uh, that would also, I feel like, would help the farmers. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'll send those to you. Also. Absolutely, that will be great. Thanks so much. While we finish up here, why don't we go ahead and go through, there was a list of uh, information, Dr. Chatori, that you said, you and Dr. Korku said that would be very useful for when a grower spots an insect uh, to, to send to us. So can you go over that information that is really helpful? So we need like an image of the insects. I can pull that list up. Uh, so what are you referring to? Is that the email I responded to a grower? Yes, yes, it's the yeah. email, yep. Mm -hmm. So whenever we have a query from a grower, uh, we first need a, at least a clear image to the possible extent. Um, so that is one key thing before we could give any suggestion or if we could, uh, for, because we don't want to give any wrong recommendation to your grower. Uh, 
uh, we will need to differentiate whether it is the insect damage or it is something fungal disease because you know sometimes the water stress also gives a reflection of a, a wilt disease so we just want to make sure if the farmer can get a clear picture of what is the stage of the crop what insect he see and like i want to make like how many plants did he see like let's take 10 as a standard sample size so is he noticing like just one plant or like on, a, on an average of 10 plants he's just seeing on like two plants so is it the same replicating in the other plots also so these are things the stage of the crop the insect a picture that shows like what the farmer is intending to know from us so yeah Okay, great. Thank you so much. That's, I think that'll be really helpful uh, for when growers are wanting to contact us. And again, I'll just tell you that first you're going to contact your main, your main contact, uh, your project contact. So that's Dr. Janine Davis. Uh, that would be for Tuskegee. That would be the organic at tuskegee.edu address. And that's Kokwase uh, Pumbleku and our team here, our entomologists here. And then Dr. Casey Berkman uh, over in Mississippi. And also, always please copy, if you're sending an email, copy organic at tuskegee.edu. And again, we're going to follow up with this information that was presented today. And if you have any questions for our entomologists, please uh, don't hesitate to, to pop an email or a phone call uh, to us. And we will be happy to address all of your, your pest or disease concerns. All, All right. right. Well, I thank everyone for joining us. We are within our time, our desired time limit today. So that's great. Um, but again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to us. And we will see you next week on the Lunchbox where we're going to cover, I believe next week is tomatoes. So please okay. come, come back and see us. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.